based on a hundred billion dollar industry of image making. And some people slash their wrists. And a lot of teenagers are very unhappy because they think they're ugly. Or older people have brown spots. That's not a culture that is self-confident. That's a culture for sale and manipulation. When we talk about violence, why don't we focus on the mass of preventable violence I mentioned earlier? Hospital malpractice, occupational diseases, air pollution, no health insurance. Once we start waking up to the collision of commercial interests against civic interests, we'll understand, and a lot of you already do, but I'm just talking generally, that any society that subordinates civic values to the supremacy of commercial values is doomed to decay. Every major religion has taught its adherents, do not give too much power to the merchant class. The money lenders, thousands of years ago. Now where did they get that idea? You think that came from revelation? Don't give too much, too much money to the profit-seeking class because they're so singular-minded they'll run roughshod and destroy, co-opt, impair far more important values like health, safety, respect for descendants and in our time, the environment. They got it from daily experience. You do not give the commercial mentality more power than it can exercise responsibly because it doesn't know when to stop. The cotton industry had slaves. They would have slaves today if the law didn't stop them. They don't know when to stop. They say, well, the other business is doing it. We got to do it to keep our costs down. They got surf labor in the third world, producing products you're buying. Because they don't have those laws against child labor, for example. So I want to conclude on, on, uh, on this uh, note, if I may, before we have a, a, a discussion. Food Day is coming up. One of the groups we started, the Center for Science and the Public Interest. They want to involve millions of Americans dealing with food, nutrition, food safety, contamination of food supplies, water, and it's October 24th, 2011. All you've got to do is check it out at cspinet.org. That's CSPI, Center for Science and the Public Interest, net.org. They have kits for you, and they did this once back in the 70s, very successfully all over college campuses. They have kits for you, and uh, it'll be a tremendous, uh, a tremendous impact in terms of nutritional use, not just nutritional awareness, more gardens grown. Now you might say, how do you disempower these giant corporations? They know how to game regulation, they buy politicians, they get deregulation, they block you from going to court. I mean, how do you get them? They've gotten smarter than ever in rolling back the efforts of the 60s and 70s of the consumer environmental and worker movements. Two general ways. We must subordinate the corporate entity to the sovereignty of the people. The idea that corporations have all the constitutional rights we have as real human beings is an egregious example of judicial extremism starting in 1886 in the Supreme Court involving a railroad. Corporations are not human beings. They are artificial entities. They employ human beings. They should not have the same rights of free speech, the same rights of protection against search and seizure. They should not have the same constitutional rights we have. Because if they do, we can never have equal justice under the law. Because in addition, they have the privileges and immunities. They have all the power, political and economic, to crush the popular spirit and the public sentiment. So there is an effort around the country to basically say the Constitution never mentions the word corporation, never mentions the word company, never mentions the word political parties. Why are we ruled by them? It does mention the sovereignty of the people. That's the way the preamble starts to our Constitution. 
we the people, not we the corporation. So we need a lot of public discussion and a lot of interface with our representatives. The corporations can never be deemed people under our Constitution, because they're not. They can create their own parents called holding company. Can you? They can go to the Bahamas and get all the services from their activities here and pay a lot less federal taxes. Can you? They can go bankrupt and pay their executives retention bonuses. Can you, if you go bankrupt? There are hundreds and hundreds of double standards. So we have to, one, subordinate, subordination. The second one is much more feasible. It's called displacement. Every time you participate in a farm to consumer market, you are displacing giant agribusiness, sales. Every time you're part of a community health clinic with emphasis on prevention, you are displacing sales of the big drug companies who often sell you drugs that harm you and you don't need and backfire. And you're replacing the sales of the big hospital insurance industrial complex. Every time you develop local community energy sources, which are more feasible now than ever before with modern technology, like wind power, through cooperative energy entities, you are, dis you are displacing the sales of Peabody Coal and Chevron and Exxon and the nuclear industry. And every time you join and make really democratic a credit union, how many people here brought credit union? Okay. Credit unions have 60 million people. The Canadians brought it to us, like so many good things, comes from Canada. Uh, and the problem is that because we don't participate as members of the credit union, management begins behaving more and more like banks. So they, they may not charge you 30 or 35 bucks for a bounce check, but they'll charge you 20. So when I say, when you expand community credit and you make them really democratic, you weaken and diminish the sales of the Bank of America and Citigroup and J.P. Morgan Chase and all the banks that are now bigger than ever and too big to fail and they'll force us to bail them out again and we're even told by them that that's what's going to happen. Cyclically. They're too big to fail to go to Washington and be bailed out. And there are fewer, bigger ones now because of the mergers and the failures of Wachovia and Washington Mutual and Merrill Lynch. They've been sucked up by these big five banks. Now this is called community economics. You know it, I know it. Why don't we make it a major national effort? Community credit, community health, community energy, even community cooperative housing, big in Europe, community food. Those displace enormous power and sales and the grip that these giant multinationals have over us. Now, this, this is... You see, all these should be part of your curriculum. That's the way to learn economics. You learn economics not just by studying Milton Friedman. You learn economics by studying Herman Daly, by studying Schumacher, Small is Beautiful. How many people have read that one? It's a great book, came out in the 70s. Small is Beautiful, Small Appropriate Technology, for example. I once, by the way, debated Milton Friedman. I can't resist telling you one exchange. He, he was full of certitude. If you think I'm full of certitude, you ought, to, you ought to listen to him. I do believe in options for revision. And uh, it came up, licensing doctors came up. The licensing of doctors. There's an audience like this, the student uh, uh, university. And he said, I want to abolish all medical licenses. He said, all it does is create barriers to entry entrenched the monopoly of the medical profession. So I said, uh, Dr. Friedman, you can't be serious. We can deal with the antitrust problem 
and barriers to entry without letting anybody, including butchers, put up signs saying they are providing medical services. What is to prevent a butcher from saying that he or she can provide surgery when there's no license? He says, nothing is worse than the present licensing system. And I said, you really think that anybody should be able to practice medicine without a license? He said, absolutely. I said, well, people are going to die. All kinds of quacks, all kinds of people are going to be doing surgery. He said, that's all right. The free market, sooner or later, people will find out who the quacks are. <laughs> For some, it would be too late, wouldn't it? And there's always new entries. So, all these should be part of the curriculum. The curriculum now is suited for the corporate job market. It's a very vocational curriculum. It's true for law schools and business schools, too, and other graduate schools. It is not a curriculum that reflects the civic needs, the needs for justice, the needs for fairness, the needs for productivity the needs for dealing with the environmental problems. There are more courses today than there were 40, 50 years ago, but still, it's overwhelmingly a vocational trade school type of curriculum. And that's been true of law schools, not as much as when I was in law school, but still, it's very heavily securities reg, tax, property, estate planning for the rich, uh, not many courses in terms of poverty. We had a course at Harvard Law School called Landlord-Tenant Law. We never got to the tenant. <laughs> you got a Harvard Law School to represent tenants, no money there. You represent big landlords. So you want to ask yourself, even in today's more enlightened curriculum, by comparison, to what extent is the curriculum, the, the courses you, you have and the courses you don't have available, Reflect the corporate job market out there. And think of a sense of legacy. Help to change that curriculum. You can start with a civic practice course. I, I don't think there are six colleges in the country that give their students an opportunity to learn civic skills. They learn computer skills, engineering skills, accounting skills, marketing skills, agronomy skills. They don't learn civic skills. Like, they don't learn how to use the Free Information Act, how to build coalitions, how to diffuse voting records, how to be resilient, how to share credit, how not to be discouraged, how not to burn 